All right, we're continuing to learn about all the different ways that materials can move across the plasma membrane. So in the last section, we learned about diffusion and how materials can move through simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. And those were both called passive transport because they happen spontaneously without needing energy. In this section, we're learning about osmosis, which is the third type of passive transport. And then we'll also be learning about the different ways that cells can actively transport materials. So our study design link is the same. We're still, our key learning intention is still that the plasma membrane controls the entry and exit of substances. So after this section, you should be able to define these three keywords, hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. Describe osmosis and describe the three methods of active transport, which we'll get to at the end. So, osmosis, which is the third method of passive transport. Osmosis is quite different to diffusion because we're not talking about chemicals dissolved in a material like food molecules or oxygen molecules. We're talking about water for osmosis. So, what osmosis, the most simple definition is it's the diffusion of water. But importantly, it has to be across a selectively permeable membrane. So diffusion can happen without a membrane. We demonstrated it where materials will diffuse through another solvent that they're dissolved in. But osmosis only happens if you've got a membrane that's separating out your container into two halves. So osmosis is when water moves across a semi-permeable membrane until the concentration of free water molecules is balanced on both sides. And just like diffusion, osmosis moves the particles of water from a high concentration to a low concentration, but it's the opposite to diffusion. Because if we have a high concentration of water molecules, that means we've got lots of water molecules on one side. And here's our selectively permeable membrane. So in this situation, we've got lots of water molecules on the left and not many on the right. So those water molecules will diffuse across the membrane to the other side until they're balanced. But if you have lots of water molecules, that means you don't have many solute particles, which are the particles dissolved. So on the left, let's say these particles are salt ions, sodium and Chloride. If there's not much, if there's a lot of water, that means we don't have much dissolved particles, so salt. But on the right, for there to be not much water, there's going to be lots and lots of salt particles. And that means the water is going to move from the high concentration of water to a low concentration of water. But that means it's going from a low concentration of salt to a higher concentration of salt. So you need to think in terms of opposites for osmosis. And let's have another look at it from another point of view as well. So here's a simulation that we'll look at in class. We've got two samples of water and we've got a selectively permeable membrane in the middle. So just imagine this is like the plasma membrane of a cell. And we've basically got the same number of water molecules on each side, 35 to 37, but roughly equal. And the difference is, on the left, we've got no solute. So all those 35 water molecules, they're free to move around and diffuse or move by osmosis. But on the right, we've got some sodium ions in there. And they're a solute that's just dissolved in the water, which happens when you put salt in water. So you can see when something dissolves, what the water molecules do is they actually surround them, surround those solute particles, and the water molecules aren't free anymore. So really, there's only this one free water molecule. So really, there's only, there's 35 on the left, but there's really only one water molecule on the right, and that's what's important. So once osmosis starts, when this membrane is, well, when the stimulation starts, the water molecules on the left 
they're um, going to move and diffuse across the cell membrane because there's a high concentration of water on the left and they're going to diffuse over to the right where there's a low concentration of water molecules. And here's the simulation at the end when it's finished and osmosis has happened. So now lots of those water molecules have diffused from left to right and now there's pretty much an even number of free water molecules on each side. There's 20 here and if we counted them on the right 10, there's about 16 on the right, so it's getting towards being equal. And what that means is that we can see the water level on the right here is actually increased because more water has moved from the left to the right through osmosis and it's actually caused that layer of water to push up higher in that side of the container. And that's exactly what osmosis can do. It can make containers or cells increase and decrease in sizes. So that leads to what actually happens in cells now. And there's three keywords that you need to know, and they all relate to what happens when we put a cell into a liquid. So we're comparing what's the concentration of water molecules inside and outside the cell. So if we get a cell and we put it into a hypertonic solution, that means there's more dissolved solute outside the cell. So high concentration of solute, like it's really, really salty water, for example. If you put a cell into a hypotonic solution, that means there's not much solute dissolved in a liquid outside the cell. So fresh water, for example, would be hypotonic compared to the cell. And then the last word is isotonic. Iso means equal or the same. And so that means you've put the cell into a liquid that has an equal amount of solute compared to the cell itself. So it's, there's an even amount of free water molecules in and out. If we're looking back at our keywords and thinking about what the scientific words mean, hyper means greater or higher than, so more solute. Hypo means lower or smaller, so that means less solute. And iso means the same. So here, these examples show us what's happening with the water molecules. So in a hypotonic solution, there's much more solute particles outside the cell. In an isotonic solution, there's an equal concentration. And hypotonic, there's a much lower concentration of those solutes. And these three scenarios have a huge impact on what actually happens to a cell. So let's find out what that actually means. So we'll take an animal cell, and a red blood cell is the classic example. If we put an animal cell into an isotonic solution, we've got an equal amount of solute in and out of the cell. So for example, we've got a solution on the outside here that's filling up all the way around the cell. It's 10% sodium chloride, which is just salt. And that means we've got 90% free water molecules. Well, remember, we're always picturing those free water molecules because they're the ones that can actually move and cross the cell membrane. And then inside the cell, because we're isotonic, we've also got 10% sodium chloride and 90% water. So in isotonic, there's no net movement of water in or out. The cell is in equilibrium. So yes, there's some water molecules moving in and out. There's some water molecules moving out, but there's also some water molecules moving in through osmosis. Because remember, diffusion and osmosis, it's not, it doesn't end. Molecules are always moving. It's just that there's an equal number going in as going out. Let's put our animal cell now into a hypotonic solution. So really, really salty and a really high concentration. So here we've got 15% sodium chloride and only 85% water. And inside the cell, we've only got 5% sodium chloride. So there's much more salt outside the cell. 
So what that means is there's not much free, there's less free water molecules on the outside. And there are more free water molecules on the inside. So if we're picturing all those water molecules, the overall result, because of osmosis being just like diffusion, those water molecules are going to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration out of the cell. And if too much water keeps moving out of that blood cell, the cell's going to shrivel up because the cytoplasm is losing lots of water. And that's what happens over here. You can see the red blood cells shrinking and it's shriveling up and we call that crenating which is really dangerous. And that's one of the reasons why we need to keep drinking water. We need to keep our cells full, otherwise they're gonna keep constantly losing water to the solution outside. The third option is if we put our cell in a hypotonic solution. So there's less solute on the outside than the inside. In this example, we've got 10% salt on the outside and 20% salt on the inside which means there's more free water molecules on the outside compared to in. And so this, in this example, because of osmosis, those water molecules overall are going to move in to that cell. And that means if we're pushing more and more water into the cell, it's filling up like a balloon and it might even expand too much that it bursts open, which has happened to this red blood cell down here. You've blown the balloon up, there's too much water in it, and now the cell's bursting open, and we call that lysis. Lys just means to break apart. So that's for animal cells, because remember, we don't have a cell wall in our cells. So we're a lot more fragile, and our bodies need to maintain our water levels really closely so that our cells don't lyse and so they don't crenate. Plants, on the other hand, they act a little bit differently because they've got that thick cell wall to give them strength. So if you put a plant cell into isotonic solution, again, nothing happens, it stays the same size. There's no osmosis. If you put a plant cell into hypotonic solution, water will move in through osmosis, but there's a limit because that thick cell wall is going to bulge and eventually hold the cell together. Cell walls don't break. So the cell will swell up, but that's the limit. And we call a plant cell that's full of water and not nice and strong, we call that turgid. After you water your plants and they um, stop wilting and they go up to holding themselves up again, all their cells are turgid. And then on the opposite case, if you put your plant cell into hypertonic, solution, so lots of water is moving out from osmosis, you can see the cell membrane actually starts to peel away from the cell wall as it shrinks, which isn't healthy, but they can still recover once if you water the plant again. And that's called plasmolysis. So it's been plasmalized. All right, here are some examples of some real cells with some electron microscope pictures. So the first one here is some cells in a hypertonic solution. So water is moving. So the solution has a high solute concentration, which means water is trying to leave those cells. And in a hypotonic solution, we've got a low solute concentration and a high water solute and a high water concentration. So those cells are swelling up and they're actually, they've actually broken. You can see this one here is broken. That one there is broken. So those cells have undergone lysis. All right, so the final section is all about active transport. Osmosis is still passive transport. So in active transport, cells are trying to move materials against their concentration gradient. And we'll talk about where it's used in a second. But for active transport, firstly, active just means it requires energy. And in the body and in all living things, energy is in the form of ATP usually. And the most important formula to remember 
is that ATP is a molecule, and to get the energy out of it, cells break it apart into ADP and phosphorus. And we put a little I there to say it's inorganic, which means it's not, um, it's not an organic molecule. It doesn't have carbon in it. So when a cell breaks apart ATP, it releases energy. So the energy is released. And that's what, the, that's what this transport method needs. The second thing it needs is a special type of transport protein, just like we did for facilitated transport, facilitated diffusion. And the proteins required are called protein pumps for active transport. And that's really what we're doing in active transport. Think of it like pumping water up into a water tank. It's not going to happen naturally to move water against gravity. And it's the same for active transport. If you're trying to get materials moved against their concentration gradient, you're trying to push your little solute particles from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. And if a cell needs to do that, it's going to take energy to do it. And here's one of these um, protein pumps. It's another one of our membrane proteins sitting there in the membrane and it attaches to some of the solute particles. Once it's attached to a solute particle, there's an ATP molecule that it uses. It breaks it apart to get the energy out of it and then it pumps one of those solute particles across the cell membrane down to where it needs to go. And then it repeats it, breaks apart an ATP, and keeps going. Just like a water pump is constantly pumping water up or across to where it needs to go. So where are all these examples of active transport actually used? How does that body use them? So there's a few examples here. We, to make our stomach a really acidic environment to digest all of our food, we need to pump in lots of hydrogen ions because hydrogen ions is the definition of acidity. More hydrogen makes it more acidic pumping sodium ions into nerve cells. If you're learning about psychology, this is how the nerve impulse is started in a nerve cell. So nerve cells, neurons, need to pump sodium out of the cell. So there's a really high concentration outside and they need to pump sodium ions into the cell. And once that's happened, then the nerve impulse can start, which is another process after that. We all also need to pump sodium Sorry, we need to pump chlorine ions out of our lung cells into our, our lungs, and those ions help our mucus to be thinner and more runny so we don't choke on it. And if you've heard of cystic fibrosis, it's a horrible genetic disease where people, their chloride ion pumps have a mutation in them and they don't actually work. So that means they have this thick layer of mucus in their lungs and it causes a whole lot of horrible symptoms for those people and they need to to have constant treatment. All right, the last method of active transport is two methods, but they're just the opposite. So the last method is called bulk transport. And just like in um, the macro world, if you need to transport bulky things, we're gonna use bulk transport. So it's for larger particles like glucose or hormones that are entering or leaving the cell. And the way both of these methods work is by making a vesicle around the material that you want to transport. So in endocytosis, endo means inward. If you want to transport things into the cell, we're going to use this process. So you can see here all the particles on the outside, these orange dots, we want to transport into the cell. And so the cell starts to pinch its membrane inwards and then it pinches it in so much that it basically captures a whole lot of those particles. And then it buds off into a vesicle and that's ready to flow through the cytoplasm to where it needs to go in the cell. And we've brought in all those molecules that we needed to. There's two key words to do with endocytosis. So if a cell is trying to capture solid materials, it's called phagocytosis, which means eating. And pinocytosis is if we're trying to bring liquids into the cell. 
So the exact opposite of endocytosis is called exocytosis. Exo just means to leave, like exit. And you can see here it's the exact opposite. So you have the cell produces vesicles with the proteins inside it, and they've come from the Golgi apparatus where they've been labeled and packaged. Then that vesicle moves up to the plasma membrane, it fuses with the membrane, and then once it's fused completely, all those particles are now on the outside of the cell and they're free to diffuse away to the bloodstream or wherever they need to go to do their job. And this process is used in plenty of different cases, particularly for hormones that get released by particular glands around the body. And for enzymes, particularly like digestive enzymes that get released into our digestive system. Your salivary glands, for example. Okay, here are some pictures of endocytosis under a, an electron microscope, step by step. And an example of exocytosis, where all this material is leaving the cell as it's being released. Okay, so you should be able to now describe all the different methods of passive transport, including osmosis, and to describe active transport using pumps and endo and exocytosis.